Greetings from the Working Class Movement Library in Salford and welcome to everybody who's here online or watching afterwards on YouTube. We're very pleased today to be welcoming Andy Croft. Andy is going to be talking to us about radical poet Randall Swingler, about whom he has written a book. We're particularly pleased also to welcome today Judy, who is Randall's daughter. Welcome to Judy. Uh, this is part of our Invisible History series, and as many of you will have heard me say before, we're very happy to provide these for free, but if you feel able to donate to the library, there is a button on our website marked Donate. I will hand over now to Andy and share the screen to start the presentation. Okay, th thanks Lynette. Thanks for asking me to do this. Um, I think almost exactly 30 years ago, I gave a talk at the library when Ruth and Eddie were there, uh, based on my first book about the 1930s writers called Red Letter Days. So uh, what I was, I was about to say is good to be back, but I'm not back, am I? I'm not, I'm not there, I'm here, which is not quite so good. But I'm gonna talk today about um, Randall Swingler, born 1909, died 1967. You probably, not many people here today will have heard of him. His books are long out of print. The magazines, the many magazines that he set up and edited uh, have long since bit the dust. The political, intellectual and cultural institutions he supported and sustained for many years have all gone. And his reputation as a writer, as a critic, as a novelist, and as, above all, as a poet and, libre and librettist um, has been completely obliterated. I first came across the name Randall Swingler in 1976 when I was a student at Nottingham University. Uh, and one morning after a tutorial with John Lucas, poet and critic, uh, John asked me if I would help carry a small display cabinet from the English department up the hill to the library. Um, the cabinet contains a number of drawings and painting, uh, drawings and cartoons by uh, James Boswell. Uh, so as I carried my end of the display cabinet up the hill, I must have idly looked in, into the display cabinet. And as well as the cartoons, there was some poems. And because Boswell was a close friend and comrade of Swingler, they worked together at Left Review. Boswell illustrated one of Swingler's best books. Um, so the name must have kind of subliminally stuck because about 20 years later in a secondhand bookshop in Hawes in Wensleydale, uh, the old Kit Calvert bookshop, I came across this tiny little ragged pink pamphlet called The God in the Cave by, oh, Randall Swingler. I remember that name, I thought, so I bought this, cost me about five pence, and spent much of a long wet weekend with my wife in Wensleydale, reading and reading and rereading these strange, painful, upsetting and mysterious poems. So I came back from that weekend wanting to find out more about the author. Who was this Randall Swingler? This was before the days of the internet. And I could find out almost nothing. All the books I've got on my shelves about the poets and the writers of the 1930s and 1940s, he was barely mentioned, except by misprint. He turns up as Rudolf Swingler or Raymond Swingler or Randolph Swingler as a footnote to the lives of poets whose reputations have survived rather better. So the more I was unable to find out about Randall Swingler, the more I wanted to find out about Randall Swingler. So I spent the best part of the next five years going around the country talking to people who had known him and with each person I met they put me in touch with someone else and the more I found out the more amazed I was. How could this writer, how could this poet, how could this organ and activist have been so completely removed from public memory. This was, it made no sense to me at all. He became more interesting the more I knew. So I couldn't wait to finish writing the biography and send it to publish because I knew they would bite off my hand when they found such an interesting character uh, who'd been lost. Um, well, that didn't happen. It took me as many years to find a publisher for the biography as it did to write it. But just to summarize what I mean when I say Swingler, it makes no sense why 
this extraordinary poet should have been forgotten for so long. So I'll just kind of summarize this with a bit of reading. His, his words, his poems were set to music by almost all the major British composers of his time, including Benjamin Britten, John Ireland, Alan Bush, Bernard Stevens, Elizabeth Lutyens, Christian Darnton, John Sykes, and Alan Rawstorn. He and Alan Bush rewrote Handel's Balshazar for the London Cooperative Movement. Uh, Swingler wrote the words of the chorale finale for Alan Bush's first piano concerto, which was broadcast uh, in 1938. Uh, he filled the Albert Hall in 1939 with a historical verse pageant starring Paul Robeson and set to music again by composers like Vaughan Williams, Arnold Cook, Victor Yates, Edmund Rubra, Eric Chisholm, Frederick Austin, Norman DeMuth, Elizabeth McConkie. McConchy. And Swinger and Auden, they wrote the text to Britain's Bad of Heroes, written to welcome the returning members of the British Battalion of the International Brigades back to London. As an editor, Swingler edited the best-selling Left Review, which was the biggest selling uh, cultural magazine of the second half of the 1930s. He was involved in negotiation with Alan Lane for the relaunch of Left Review by Penguin. In the end, Alan Lane decided to go for the Communist Party magazine, New Writing, which he turned into Penguin New Writing. Swingler helped edit and publish Nancy Cunard's famous Authors Take Sides on the Spanish Civil War questionnaire, which sold 5,000 copies in two weeks. He was incredibly active in the Workers' Music Association, for which he and Alan Bush wrote a whole load of songs. In 1938, Swingler and Bush they edited the Left Songbook for the Left Book Club. He founded his own radical paperback publishing company called Four Publications, which sold half a million books in the first year. And in 1939, he was appointed literary editor of The Daily Worker. And as the night editor, of the Daily Worker on the night of the 3rd of September, when there was no other editors in the building, the ticker tapes came through saying that German soldiers had got into Poland. So Swingler wrote the editorial, which appeared in the paper the following day, this is the war which can and must be won, thereby aligning the Communist Party to the war, a position which the party had to repudiate two weeks later when instructions came from the Comintern that this was not a war that could be fought. Or one. Swingler worked on the Daily Worker reporting on the Blitz until the paper was banned in 1941. He wrote a whole lot of plays for Unity Theatre, uh, including the mass declamation Spain, which was the first performance piece about the, the war in Spain. He wrote the Munich play Crisis and reviews like Sandbag Follies and Get Cracking. He wrote a new version of Pierre Gint for Rupert Doon's celebrated group, group theatre. He edited, after the failure of Left Review, he edited the magazine Poetry and the People, which he then relaunched as Our Time. Uh, it was relaunched with adverts on the, the escalators on the London Underground all over London. During the Second World War, while most of Swingler's more famous contemporaries were working for the BBC, or in the case of Auden and Isherwood in the United States, Swingler served with the 56 Divisional Signals, mostly with the 8th Army in North Africa and in Italy. He took part in heavy fighting on the Volturno and Garigliano rivers, Monte Camino, and on the Salerno and Anzio beachheads. He was buried alive for several hours at one point. For his part in the Battle of Lake Comaccio, Corporal Swingler was awarded the Military Medal for Bravery. I'm going to read a couple of his war poems later, but I can only think of a few writers like Ilya Ehrenberg or Boris Slutsky, Louis Aragon or Hamish Henderson, who wrote so importantly and so vividly and so memorably as Swingler did. After the war, he edited the magazines Our Time and then Arena and then Circus. And later he, he was on the editorial board of The New Reasoner and on the founding board of New Left Review. So he spans, the period from Left Review to New Left Review. Well, that's a biography, and I've done a, I've done a, very, a very summary sprint of this man's life and this man's, the, the impact he had as a, as a writer, as an editor, as an organiser, as someone who brought together audiences and readers and writers. Um, he was also very active in the, the Left Book Club, going around the country 
speaking. It seems to me impossible to write an honest and serious account of the intellectual history of Britain in the middle decades of the 20th century without including the work of this most remarkable man. And I've not even begun to talk about the, the importance of his work as a poet, but just in terms of his impact. He, Randall Swingler, was the most famous poet, the most famous writer in the Communist Party for many years, uh, which may not seem like a great claim now, but it was in the, in the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s. It was a, a reputation which he'd earned, and which he, which was justified and which brought him a great deal of opprobrium, um, as you will, you will see in a minute. Um, I lost my piece of paper. Sorry. So the results of my research went into, first of all, uh, a selection of Swingler's poems published by Trent Publications, and then Manchester University Press published this big junky hardback biography called Comrade Hart. Well, these two books, I thought, should start to rebalance the picture. Once people saw what an extraordinary figure he was and what a beautiful writer he was, then uh, the balance of his reputation would change. But that's not how things work in the UK. Uh, of course, both books were barely reviewed at all. Uh, it made no difference. The canon of Inglit goes grinding on, telling us that it's Stephen Spender and George Orwell that somehow represent the best of their generation. And the historical record remains untouched. Most books about British writers, British poets, even British communist poets in 1930s and 40s still somehow manage not to mention Randall Swingler which is a source of immense frustration um, for me, not because I want my research to be appreciated, but because I want the life and the work and the poetry to be understood. But history is always much more interesting than historians allow. And I think Swingler's case demonstrates this spectacularly. But in frustration, I ended up writing a series of long, apologetic letters in verse to Swingler, which were collected and published a few years ago, uh, in which I tried to explain and to apologize why I'd done so poorly by him. And I just want to read you a little bit of this. This is where I wrote <coughs> to explain why the, the biography had made no difference at all. So it is written in Atava Rima. I know I said, sorry, I'm writing to his ghost. I know I said that once your life was out, the pair of us could go our separate ways. My hope of fame and fortune up the spout, I'd write instead the kind of book that pays while you could rest in peace again without being pestered by my questions or my praise. So many years of working in your shadow was turning me into a right old shadow. But alas, it didn't work out as I'd planned. The walk on parts which fortune has assigned us Mark out our way like footsteps in the sand, then vanish as the tide comes in behind us. Like castaways who think we've reached dry land, too late we find leviathans undermined us. I'm writing this somewhere inside the whale that swings the volumes of its horrid flail. Today, you see, you've had just seven reviews. Too few when you consider how much strife your life has caused us both, though most enthused, they said I should have used a sharper knife when quoting from your verse. I stand accused of being too long-winded in your life as well as mine. If only I'd condensed it. That's bollocks. We were always up against it. But I'm sure you will be gratified to know our book came out in time for the centenary of bloody Eric Blair. See more below. His monumental lives obscured the scenery so thoroughly that nothing else could grow, like one who takes possession of a deanery. He brought with him the sanctimonious air, precise, precisely suited the age of Blair. Okay, 
so kind of given up really. Um, I'd given up writing to Randall's ghost. I'd given up expecting anyone ever to take any interest uh, until I noticed a few years ago that his words still continue to circulate. I mean, rather incredibly, at the moment, the, there are settings of Randall's poems uh, available on CD, set to music by uh, Alan Bush, um, Benjamin Britten, Eric Chisholm, John Sykes, Bernard Stevens, Brian Daubney, Alan Rawstorn. Uh, the Alan Bush, Randall Swingler um, piece, The Winter Journey, was premiered in Hanover a couple of years ago. Advanced Democracy, which Swingler wrote with Britain, was sung in the Houses of Parliament a few years ago. Uh, this was an event organised by the House of Parliament Education Service on the theme of democracy. Ballad of Heroes, that Swingler and Auden and Britain wrote, was performed at the proms in 2017 and the following year at an Armistice Day centenary concert, concert at the Kennedy Center in Washington. So while the reputation's been obliterated, the words continue to circulate. And then of course it turned out that I'm not the only person who was interested in Randall Swinger. Because a few years ago, MI5 released 20 years worth of the files that they'd been keeping on Randall Swingler. So it's not the whole lot. In fact, the first volume, the first three or four years, was apparently lost in a fire. Uh, but it, so it runs from 1939, 1938, I think, to 1956. And there's still hundreds of pages crossed out and redacted, presumably to protect the identity of the sources, because at one point MI5 had at least one mole placed amongst the musicians and poets that Swingler and his wife Geraldine and their friends that they used to drink with. So MI5, what were they doing being interested in? Because no one's interested in Randall, Randall Swingler, so why would MI5 be interested in Randall Swingler? Well, it's not because he was working for the Russians. He first came to their attention in 1936 because he and Alan Bush had written a song called Song of the Hunger Marchers, which was written to support the arrival of the fifth national hunger march into London. Um, just a song. It was performed at a concert on the Saturday night when they arrived uh, into London. And it goes along these lines. Remember fellow workers who earn a wage today that they'll throw you on the scrap heap when they find it doesn't pay. So that was enough. That was enough for MI6, MI5 to open a file and begin at least 20 years worth of having an army of people following the swinglers wherever they went. So there are hundreds of pages and thousands of entries. Uh, it's mostly nonsense. We've got the registration numbers of cars parked outside the house, the pictures on their walls, the concerts they attended, how often they went to the pub and how long they stayed there, the names of people they drank with, the file contains poems, bank statements, intercepted letters, reports of dozens of talks and readings, transcripts of telephone conversations to and from the Communist Party King Street headquarters. Uh, in 1941, Special Branch submitted a highly detailed two-page biography of Swingler, which included everything, including the date and place of the Swingler's wedding. Every time Randall and Geraldine went to the continent, their suitcases were searched at New Haven or at London Airport on the way in and on the way out. And every time some dullard from Special Branch has to write down, nothing of interest a Special Branch was found during the examination of their baggage. Because of course they never did find anything because there was never anything to find. On the other hand, the files do contain some rather good summaries of many of his public lectures, including a two page, a two page precy of a talk that Swingler gave in 1947 to the Hampstead Communist Party branch on education for all or culture for the few. The fact that special branch dated Swingler's membership of the Communist Party from 1935 suggests that they had good reason to do so. And before reading their files. I didn't know that Swingler worked for Malcolm McEwen in the 1941 Dumbarton by-election, producing a twice-weekly by-election special. Or in 1951, he was elected to the publications panel at the foundation meeting of the Authors World 
peace appeal or that MI5 considered him so dangerous that they placed at least one informant to report on him. Now this informant in the files uh, always appears as conquest. And this, this conquest uh, was a close friend of the Swinglers and of the Bushes and obviously hung out, hung out in poetry, musical and communist party circles. As it happens, Robert Conquest, the famous cold, post-war Cold War warrior, was a good friend of the Swinglers at the time. So I did have to ask Robert Conquest, are you or have you ever been <laughs> working for MI5? Uh, and of course he said no. So you have to, uh, have to accept what he said. So whoever this Conquest was, we don't know. But this Conquest was convinced that the William Morris Music Association, which was set up by Alan Bush to provide talks and concert music uh, in the early years of the Second World War in central London was actually a front for passing secret military information to the Russians. Conquest was also convinced that Geraldine, uh, Swingler's wife, and her sister Mary, uh, they were professional concert pianists and they gave a lot of concerts at the Soviet embassy during the war. And of course, MI5 and Conquest were convinced that she was, they were couriers for. Uh, intelligence in and out of the Soviet embassy, because why else would they be doing that? What, just playing, just playing Bach and Mozart to the Russians is obviously a cover. MI5 were completely obsessed with Swingler's appearance. They keep saying he wears his hair very long, hair unkempt, a bohemian type, a man of communist appearance, untidy brown hair, has the appearance of a communist. Well, you, you can't win, can you? <laughs> He's got untidy hair, whereas Geraldine, obviously MI5, rather fancy Geraldine, they keep describing her being very smart appearance. In 1953, Swinger was so broke that he got, got a job fixing motorbikes in a garage uh, in Essex where they were living at the time. It turned out that the garage had a contract for repairing mo motorbikes for the local MOD depot. Immediately, MI5 go bonkers thinking, what is this man doing repairing motorbikes, which may be used uh, in the MOD depot? So that job came to a halt. Um, during the war, when Swingler was out in Italy, uh, and then in, in North Africa, then in Italy, MI5 made sure that he was not allowed to apply for a commission. Not the Swingler wanted one. He made it perfectly clear that he wanted to, if he was going to fight the war, he had to be in the ranks. He did not want to hang out with the kind of public school boys who he'd known when he was at public school. But later, they MI5 blocked his application to join the Intelligence Corps. After the war, when he applied for a job teaching in army education, they put a block on that. In 1948, Swingler applied for a job as a scriptwriter at the BBC. He'd been doing lots of freelance work at the BBC. Uh, and MI5's files include the correspondence in which the BBC were obviously very impressed with Swingler at the interview. They liked the work he'd been doing for them. They were going to give him the job, but they thought they'd just better check with MI5 first. And MI5 said, oh, but our dead body, you're not giving this job. So Swingler didn't get a job. And thereafter, his access as a freelancer to the BBC was pretty well curtailed. Um, so there's nothing going on, but a lot going on. This is the most famous writer the Communist Party ever had, who has been somehow removed from the picture. I mean, the consequences for Swingler were very serious in terms of his ability to uh, be published, his ability to earn any money at all. But more seriously, the long-term consequence was the isolation and the expulsion from post-war British intellectual life of a writer like Randall Swingler, who had worked so hard to develop a democratic and participative culture in Britain in the 1930s and the 1940s. And as a result, the lessons of the democratic people's war and its cultural upswirge were lost because premature anti-fascists, which is what Swingler was, were systematically excluded first from public life and then from public memory. So the new biography, which we're supposed to be talking about today, published by Routledge, 
uh, it's the old version expanded to include all MI5's papers and other research I've done on Swinglet since then around the MI5 work. So I'll finish talking there now. In a few minutes, I'm going to read a few of Swingler's poems, but has anyone got any questions? Well, yes, what I should have said at the beginning was that we were going to do things slightly differently this time. And so it's a two part operation. And if people have any questions or comments now on what they've heard, extraordinary as it is, uh, that would be great. And then we, we, Andy's going to read some poems. I'm sorry, we've, we've had a, a few bandwidth problems, I think, with that with Andy is a sort of I think we've not missed anything, but sometimes there's been a bit of a delay in, in what Andy's been saying. But hopefully you're, mm. you're all still with us. Um, if anybody would like to, ah, oh, we've got something, right. Uh, Tabitha says a comment. My grandfather was a socialist MP and a card carrying communist. He was expelled as an MP when it was discovered he was a communist. He passed his knowledge of Swingler to my father who passed it to me, which is amazing. So. Oh, so who was, whose contribution this, was that? This is, this is somebody called Tabitha. Let's see if I can find her. Should we try and un, should we try and, well, try and unmute you? Can you unmute yourself? Yes, that's me. <laughs> that's me. Do you want to tell us some more? Um, well, there's not much really more to tell. Um, you know, my grandfather was a, a socialist MP in Wilsdon in London. And he was, a, as I said, he was a card carrying communist. And when this was discovered, he was expelled as an MP. He was also part of one of the first groups that ever visited Mother Russia to see, you know, how workers organized themselves there. And um, so Tabitha, he, what was your grandfather's knew, name? Tabitha, my what grandfather's was your gra name? Yeah. William Francis Franklin. And my father's name is okay. William Francis Franklin. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to either ask a question or type something into the chat? Anything you've heard so far? James put into the chat the, the link to the Routledge book if you want to rush and make a purchase after you've uh, after you've listened to the poems. Uh, so we have a question from Sue. How did the persecution by MI5 affect Randa's mental health? Did it take him, make him more determined or want to shut up? Um, I think perhaps we ought to bring Judy in, to, which you might be able to answer this question better okay. than I can. And what I can say quickly is that after the war, when Swingler came back, uh, he was suffering from a survivor's um, trauma really um yeah. he had a strong feeling that he shouldn't have survived when so many others hadn't when so many better men so many of his friends hadn't so he was struggling with that also he and Geraldine their marriage had problems when he first came back from the war which wasn't helping and he started drinking more than was good for him whether that's answered your question but Judy what, what would you say about that um, I would say that it, I mean, it, it his whole life it, uh, after the war was pretty miserable in a way for him because he was totally unaccepted um, for the things he w would like to have done. Um, and it was a struggle to try and earn enough money to keep them going, really. Mm. I mean, Geraldine put in quite a bit with her concerts and BBC you know, programmes and things, but um, I, it was hard and it was pretty, he was quite uh, troubled, I think, um, for probably the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question from Marshall. Can you say something about the mass choral works, Trafalgar Square? He says. The mass <laughs> choral works in Trafalgar Square. I mean, you think about Jack Lindsay's mass declamations. Hang on, let's let's get Marshall to unmute himself. Do you want? Can you press unmute, Marshall? I can. Uh, 
Yes, I may be getting confused between one and the other, but I've having read quickly through some of the uh, manuscripts you put up, um, did he get involved in that type of thing rather than performance at people, uh, people have been involved and uh, in the thing as a whole? Yeah, I think Swingler actually, you could say, pioneered the idea of the mass declamation, um, which was sort of halfway between a performance poem and a play, like a tableau. Um, so people aren't acting on stage, they are presenting, it's voices on stage. It's like a radio play for large numbers of people on a stage. He'd been doing that, he'd been writing these uh, when he was at Oxford, actually, uh, he was at New College, and at the time he was quite an active Christian. So he wrote a couple of these mass declamations for like a boys club he was doing. So Swinger was actually beginning to develop this long before they came across what people were doing in New York or people who were doing in Berlin. So I mentioned Spain, his first mass declamation for um, Unity Theatre, which was put on right at the very, very beginning in the first weeks of the Spanish Civil War, before people knew what the conflict was going to turn into. Um, that, I think, is probably his most successful. But the pageants he wrote for the Communist Party, for the, the pageant he wrote for the uh, 25th anniversary of the Daily Worker, the, the pageant he wrote for the huge festival of musical and the people. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. You have voices coming to the front of the stage. You have uh, a chorus at the back of the stage. Other, other voices come to the front. So it's not acting. It's presenting a large, dramatic um, kind of tableau poem to an audience. I think Swingler was very good at that. Unfortunately, they don't work quite so well on the page as a lot of performance poetry is better on the stage than it is on the, the page. So in the selected poems, uh, I didn't include, it, it's, it can be a bit wearing uh, on the page, but it wasn't ever written for the page. But I think Swingler was uh, one of the earliest exemplars of that kind of the living newspaper, as it was late, later called in the United States. So does that answer your question? Oh, sorry, Marshall, I, I muted you back again. Do you want to be unmuted again? Well, just to say thank you very much. That really opens up quite a lot, considering the amount of noise that's made in the arts today about uh, inclusion, shall we say. Um, <laughs> And um, yes, uh, if, it, if it isn't written up yet, can, please, can you write an essay about it forthwith? Thank you. You do it. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're not shaking this one off easily, Andy. You thought you thought you got it to us, but no, there's more to come. I was going to uh, say he's so, had enough. I said he's had enough. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> <laughs> Stuart says, you mentioned that Swingler left the CP in 1956, presumably over Hungary. How did this affect the content of his work? Well, it didn't help with his spirits. Um, having given so much of his life and so much of his money, to be honest, uh, to the Communist Party, this was not an easy decision for him to make. Um, the poet Jack Beeching, who was in the same Communist Party branch in Essex told me, I'm not entirely sure he could always believe Jack Beeching, uh, but Jack Beeching said that when Swingler resigned at the branch, uh, it was in tears, which may be as kind of believable. Uh, Swingler was never far from tears of laughter or tears of uh, sorrow. So that is possibly believable. But, um, it meant the loss of some friendships and it meant the loss of his intellectual home because where else could you go in 1956? He, he made it quite clear he was not going to uh, start relaunching the left as his young friend Edward Thompson and John Savile, which they were doing with the, the new left. So Swingler kind of reluctantly gave his support to the new reasoner, no, enthusiastic support for the new reasoner, and then reluctant support for new left review, which he felt was just going to make the same old mistakes um, so we kind of ret retired into a permanent despair, certainly in his poetry, uh, in the last 10 years of his life. Is that, Judy, does that make sense? Does that seem Yes, like I think you? that's fair. Yeah, he did write quite 
a lot of poetry towards the end of his life. Mm -hmm. um, not published. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to read some of those in a minute. I said if, needless what, to say. <laughs> if there's no more questions, I'll, can I read some of Swinger's poems? Poets? Sure, let's, uh, let's just mute myself back and then yeah, back over to you, Andy. Okay, because there's, there's no point in making the case for Randall Swingler just as a novelist, editor, playwright, pageant writer, um, activist, speaker, important though those roles were. It's as a poet that he needs to be remembered and needs to be understood. So I'm just going to re read half a dozen poems to give you a sense of the range of his work over his life. Um, starting with, this is a poem he wrote right at the beginning of the Second World War. It's a series of love letters to Geraldine, in which he's trying to explain to her that he's not going to be able to go and fight unless she gives him absolute permission, knowing that he might die. That if he's going to start worrying about her while he's away overseas, then is not going to work. Letter six. If you are beside me when the sirens go and I am called to fight for what I believe and die perhaps that after me men may live as men unchained and into freedom grow, I shall be brave enough I know to take upon myself without regretting the mud of war, the inevitable bloodletting and while your will goes with me, I shall not grieve. More than aught else, I fear your possible grief, casting its net upon me, halting my power, proving that neither you nor I have satisfied love's first necessity. For love's satisfaction is not a thing of time, is not brought nearer by one additional hour. Love is not love in anything more than name, while we have any loss to fear. For while a part of either is possessed, that man or woman is whole by so much less. By so much less is loved, for where is power imprisoned, there is man less mature. Love liberates by making whole. Then if we have not failed, we have all we need, and we are whole now, and love is true. There can be nothing to lose of me or you. So when that old reaction, driven to bay, spits its last poison against our rising life, I shall be gladly obedient to my belief and to your love that freed such life in me. I think that's an extraordinary poem. It's an extraordinary statement of intent. It's an extraordinary love poem, really. Um, a soldier writing to his wife. Uh, the second poem I want to read, it's, it was written on the eve of the Salerno landings when uh, the 56 divisional signals were going from North Africa uh, and landing uh, in Italy, landing, landing in, in Sicily. What they didn't know was that the Germans and the Italians were waiting for them. So it's called Briefing for an Invasion. So it's looking ahead to the, what's going to happen over the next two days. Tomorrow, he said, is fixed for death's birthday party. A gala show on the beaches and all invited. Fireworks and aerobatics and aquatic diversions. Tomorrow, you can be sure of a grand reception. At 0400 hours, when the night grows sickly, and the sand slips under your boots like a child's nightmare, clumsy and humped and shrunken inside your clothes, you will shamble up the shore to give death your greeting. Not all those present will shake him by the hand, but none will pass on without looking into his face. The moment may seem chaotic, but be content. A world has laboured for this supreme occasion. And over your heads and over all crouching Europe, the sky will be lashed with sounds too huge for hearing. But to some listening inland, it will seem like the great inarticulate word 
freedom howled by the dead. Your skull will be filled with the hoarse breathing of death and the gossip and chatter of all his ghostly devices, the dust suddenly spouting with ferocious flowers and the air canopied with a charnel smell. And when the white sun stretches across the land, the ships will litter the sea like deer at grazing. An other and pitiful litter along the shore, the cat spore waves will lick and leave like vomit. Oh, love, is it worth it? And are the dead rewarded with a bearer bond on history's doubtful balance? And is the loss redeemed by a sunset glory and a sweet transfusion of blood to a newborn world? No, it will never be worth it, nor the loss redeemed. The dead die hideously and there is no honour. The blood that runs out in the sand can only embitter the violence of a fate that is still unmastered. Even though some should slip through the net of flame and life emerge loaded with secret knowledge, won't they be dumb, sealed off by the awful vision? Or should they speak, would anyone ever believe? Only this pride we have, both now and after, because we have grasped the fate ourselves created, and to have been the centre of contradiction, and not to have failed, and still to have found it hateful. That last line seemed to be one of the really great lines of Second World War poetry. I'll read it again. Not to have failed, and still to have found it hateful. Stringler was a communist. He was an anti-fascist. He knew why he was there. He knew what they, what they had to do, but he still wasn't taking any pride in it. He knew it was still hateful. People were going to die tomorrow morning on both sides. And that was hateful, but it was also important not to fail. That contradiction, only something Homeric, I think, about uh, that insight. It's the soldier's understanding, not to have failed, but still to have found it hateful. As he says, it will never be worth it, and the loss is not redeemed. It's still full of terrible waste and carnage and pointless suffering, but it has to be done. And that's what Swingler's writing, that contradiction, his poems return to again and again. Um, here's a short one he wrote on the day that the war ended. When he was on the Italian-Yugoslav border by then. On the day the war ended, the sun laced through the avenues with lime tree scent. The silver birches danced on the sidewalk and the girls came out like tulips in their colours. Only the soldiers were caught, like sleepwalkers, wakened unaware, naked there in the street, fatuous in flowers, their tanks tamed elephants, wallowed through the crowds in the square. There is a moment when contradictions cross, a split of a moment when history twirls on one toe like a ballerina and all men are really equal and happiness could be impartial for once. Only the soldier, snatched by the sudden stop in his world turning, whirled like a meteor through a phoenix night of stars is falling, falling. And as his trajectory bows and earth begins to pull again, his hollow ears are moaning with a wild tone of sorrow and the loss, the loss. There was never anything triumphalist about Swingler's writing about war or about fascism or about its defeat. But as I said, when he got back from Italy, eventually in 1946, uh, he was in a bad way because of the survivor's guilt. And he wrote a long series of poems about Lazarus. This is called Lazarus or the Walking Dead. It's the first one, it's just a little sonnet. On the hither bank of battle, he made a deal with death to take away the aching pack of fear should he gain say, all hope, all expectation, all regret. Death signed and kept his pledge. The soldier laughed and sang in the sweat of hell and by sheer accident defaulted on his debt, emerged bewildered on life's further edge, 
haunted. Returning to the source of hate, he kicks the dust of ruin which he made, but finds no key and is not justified. He owes a debt to death and has not paid. How will he ever expatiate the guilt of being alive? which is about as beautifully bleak or as bleakly painful as I think it's possible to get in a poem about surviving a war. Um, so the last two little poems I'm going to read just to... He did carry on writing poems about events, the warring career. Uh, he wrote a beautiful poem about the Nazi extermination of the people in Lidice or Lidice, however you pronounce it. Um, but the, the last two I want to finish with are, what's it like being a communist after 1956 in divided Europe, divided Britain, without your intellectual home? Uh, it's a little poem called Three Trees. Behind my house stands, stand, sorry. Behind my house stands guardians, three, an oak, an ash, and a willow tree, an oak for strength, an ash for thought, a willow to watch my feeling heart. 40 years long, my oak has grown rugged and reaching and rude as stone. As many years, my ash has bent to the smooth winds of argument, but in between, in autumn yellow, weeping, leans my broken willow. And then the last thing I want to read. Uh, Short before he died, Swingler wrote a kind of epic poem called The Map, uh, in which he tries to trace uh, the path he'd taken after 1956, when the map, he said, blew up in his hand and he didn't know which direction to walk in. And he recorded the poem for Radio 3 and it was broadcast a few weeks after he died in 1967. So the thing's called the map and it's just the last few lines of the whole thing, um, which is, it becomes sort of hymn to darkness and a hymn to silence. Dear Comet Silence, who, some while hence, streaked across my star-shot mind, now in your wake of dark, leave me but one infant spark of peace and kindliness, if only to let me know that all is done and it is time to go. Thank you. Any questions about any of the poems I've read or the poems I haven't read? We've had at least one person say that, well, we've had one person say it's brought them to tears mm. and I suspect that's that's not the only one. So people will be reflecting. I, I'm sure somebody has said how amazing that he's not been acknowledged more. And uh, they, uh, she could see his life being a very successful BBC documentary. Oh yeah, the BBC could really bite go for this one, won't they? Why would they do that? They're far too complicated. They've invested, the BBC and the Guardian, everyone, they've invested so much in the, in the lives of Stephen Spender, George Orwell, to, acknowledge, to, in, to make any room for Randall Swingler would, the, the whole edifice, the, the 1930s and 40s can be reduced to Dylan Thomas in a bar, George Orwell going out to Spain, Stephen Spender wandering about being an idiot. I mean, that it's too late, I think, to, to uh, make any room because everything would, once you allow Swingler in, then there's, why would you include Stephen Spender or George Orwell at all? Because as writers, as men, as figures, as, as what they contributed was so much less. Swingler would be, would, would be, an embarrassing example to be to, to be allowed onto the team because it'd be so much better than anyone else. 
if if Lionel Messi turned up and said he wanted to play in my five-a-side football game, to be honest, I don't think we'd let him because it would just be embarrassing. <laughs> He's too good. And Swingler was really very, very good. Yeah, we've got we we now have a sense of that, and people are saying they're going to look him up and find out more. So this is definitely you, you your your passion comes across, Andy. Is uh, yeah, Judy. I'm going to unmute you in case there's any more that you'd like to say. Well, ask you to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. um, I don't think so. I think Andy's done a fantastic job. I don't need to enlarge on it really. Okay. Thank you. Well, we're very glad. Uh, uh, I enjoyed his reading of the poems, I must say. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and for those who joined us uh, a bit late, Judy is Randall Swinkler's daughter. So we're particularly pleased to have her here today. Uh, has, has anybody else got a, a question that they would like either to tap in, type into the chat or wave at me or, or comment? Anybody want to wave at me? Sue's waving at me. Oh, she thinks that you that you think you should be publicised. Hang on, do you want to say? Go on, tell us what you just said, Sue. No, there you are. You're on. Yeah, uh, it, it's just the the war poetry that he was talking about. The feelings about fighting in the war. I, because of my work, I've interviewed a lot of first uh, first world war veterans, and it really, really expresses the sort of thing that they were saying. And I, th I really think it should be publicised, if only as an anti-war effort, you know, because mm. um, it's so true what he was saying and the, the, the sort of the way they were haunted by by the yeah. feelings and the conflict of feeling and everything else. It was so good. I think I, the problem is that our intellectual culture, such as it is, um, has been so much shaped by the poet's of the First World War, by which I mean the ones who were published 10 years after the First World War, uh, like Sassoon and Owen and Edward Thomas, the ones we think of as the anti-war poets, the pacifist poets. Um, their work was so great and so important that it became, it has become impossible to understand that war poetry can be anything else than beautifully sad. The poetry is in the pity. Um, so the, this is the terrible cul-de-sac for writers that you can only be beautifully elegiac about your pointless death uh, without ever talking about the context of it. So poets of the Second World War who were fighting a quite different conflict have been, have been the victims of this. Because of, of a swingler, he was absolutely against war, but he was absolutely in favor of prosecuting the Second World War, when it could no longer be avoided. Not many public intellectuals work so hard or for so long to try and avoid the Second World War, and no British intellectual fought so hard or so long during the war to win the war when it could no longer be avoided. And that, and that meant that he was on a hiding to nothing. So Dylan Thomas's poem, that refusal, refusal to warn by death of a child, you know the one I mean. Um, or Stephen Spender's poem about poem about the about the Blitz. Well, they're they're perfect because they just fit the idea that war is somehow like a, a natural disaster that lands on our beautiful heads, and all we can do is be elegiac and handsome about it. But the idea of fighting a bloody, brutal, necessary, justified, but hateful war intellectually, that's much more complicated. Only soldiers would understand that. And not enough British writers were in uniform during the period 1939 to 1945, which is why the Second World War is a sort of black hole in British intellectual history. All people can think of is, oh, wasn't there that guy? What was he called? Um, what's his name? Someone Douglas, was it? Oh, yeah. And there's someone else. What was he? Uh, um, John Jarmain? I don't know. So the Second World War poet, poetry barely exists in terms of British literary history in this Second World War, which is where, where which is where Swingler's work should be. And that's the context where it can be understood and appreciated and its importance, its scale uh, really appreciated. But our literary culture can't allow that because it's so locked into the myth of uh, the handsome dead in 1914, 1918. 
I hope that made sense. Sorry, it's a bit of a rant. That's why it should be published, isn't it? Because it's yeah. different. You know. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Peter asks, is his poem on Le Dice in print? Um, well. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Judy, Judy may have an answer here. Hang on. Yeah, go on, Judy. Um, as, well, it, the Rose of Lidzi, which um, was put to music by Alan Rawson, um, that, I mean, that, I don't know whether it's in print, but it was printed by Oxford University Press Music Department. Yeah. Um, I don't so know whether... You can, you can buy a CD of Alan Rawson's setting, also a Brian Daubney's setting, <coughs> and in the CD, you get the lyrics to, I think you get the lyrics to the poem in both cases. <laughs> I think so too. Um, sorry, Judy? Yes, I think so too. But I'm, I don't, I can't, off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure. If anyone wants me to send a copy of uh, any of the individual poems I've read, uh, or the Lidici one, if you can email me, um, can we do this? Is this GDPR okay for me to give it's out up my to email you, address? You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go okay, on. Talk to my, better talk to my agent about this. Okay, <laughs> so my email address is info at smokestack-books.co.uk. All lowercase, info at smokestack-books.co.uk. So I'll send you copies of any of the poems that you've heard me read this afternoon. Well, you've got a lot of people writing down at that point, Andy. That, that looks promising. If anybody didn't manage to grab a pen in time, just, just contact the library and we could we can forward an email to, to Andy there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to have a whole box of the uh, Lazarus, the book which has Lazarus in it, Andy. I don't you know did, whether I've you? still got... I don't know whether I've still got them or whether they <laughs> went to um, Birmingham university instead <laughs> yeah i think oh, I've got... is that where the papers are judy yes ah okay most of them i mean i still collect things i've still got some things here i'm in my house good <laughs> important for you to have that connection still but i'm glad that birmingham university are, are, are looking after other things that's great to know mm. yeah yes Ray, are you waving a hand at me? Do you want to say something? Yeah. But I just want to thank Andy for the most wonderful afternoon. I mean, here I am, 23, and I've never heard of Randolph Swingler. I feel totally ashamed, but it's it was just wonderful. And I have also known people in my life who went through the same stages as him. I was so interested in what he said about what Swindler was feeling after 1956, for example. So it was fascinating. So just one question, Andy. Um, I will buy your book, the latest one. Um, I'm afraid uh, that's it's the years of anger. It's horribly expensive. expensive. I'm really sorry. Is it horribly expensive? Oh dear. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but the uh, can I get to order it from my local bookseller, which I like to do? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, does it include any of his poems? I oh, like yes. it nonetheless, but I would like the poems in as well. Yeah, there's loads of poems quoted in the book. Yes. Oh good. Thank you. And thank you again. No, thank you very much. That's kind. Yes, Thanks, Andy. Ray. Thank you, Andy. I agree. Yeah. Like, good to have that. Even if you can't actually see face to face your audience, that you can tell that um, how appreciative they are, Andy. There's been lots of nice things in the chat which I can forward to you as well, so you you get more of a sense of it. I think that often when when you find someone who's kind of uh, got got a real focus on a particular person or a particular topic, that you, you kind of think, goodness me, this is over the top. Why? But I think everybody here has understood absolutely why it has been your passion for such a long time to to get this man better better known and. Uh, it's fantastic that you've had such an engaged audience, but that you've 
put across so wonderfully your, your passion and, and enthusiasm. And we're all delighted to know more about Randall Swinkler. If you can't find Years of Anger elsewhere, I would remind you that there's a copy in the library and you are very welcome to come to the library and uh, and read that and the other um, material by Randall that we have in the library. Just just drop us a line if you're, if you're local and you're, you're able to come in. Um, but I'd, uh, I'd, I think we're drawing to a close at this point. Nobody else is waving at me. So uh, thanks so much, Judy, for coming, but particular That's thanks cool. obviously to, to Andy for for bringing us there. Lots of virtual applause coming your way, Andy. Um, that's great. But we're, we're oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's that's been terrific. So thanks very much, and thanks to everybody for attending and and um, being being part of it. Uh, we hope that we will see some, if not all, of you next week. Um, next week we're marking Black History Month. So two o'clock next Wednesday, the 28th of October, we have Deej Malik Johnson, who is going to be talking to us about activist and boxer Len Johnson. We've got material uh, by uh, and about Len and his uh, Communist Party background as, as well of his boxing career in the library. There's a very interesting um, feature up on the BBC website at the moment as well about Len, if you want to, to have a look in advance. But we do hope that you'll want to join us again next week. If uh, you were able only to tune in late, or if you can't come next week, but you'd like to, to hear us, a reminder that we record these uh, talks and they go up on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash WCM library. So do encourage other people to find out more about Randall Swingler by, by joining in and looking at this talk, which I hope to have uploaded um, later this afternoon. So I shall just uh, finish by saying, if you want to click on that donate button on the library website, we'd be delighted to hear from you. And um, to say, take care everybody in solidarity, all the best from the Working Class Movement Library. Thank you very much. Thank you.